What's wrong with this new generation? They've never had it so good, but they're always worried. They've never had so much, they're never satisfied. They've never had so much information, but they don't use it. They've never been so connected, and yet they feel as if everything depends on them. They've never had so much variety. And yet most of them just want to fit in. What's wrong with them? Sadly, these same comments and concerns, they, they, can be, they can be inquired of every generation. Including your generation and mine. So let me start with some confrontation this evening. What's wrong with you? Why are you worried why do you often feel that the only solution to the problem lies in you yourself? And why are you scared of standing out and looking weird? This chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 8, speaks to these very questions in a way that I think transcends every generation. We're going to see that they were worried. They're worried about the future. It's looking shaky now. Samuel's getting old. They only look to themselves for the answer, however, despite the warnings that they were given. And then we'll see how they just wanted to fit in. They didn't want to be the odd one out among the nations of the world. And so, yes, we're going to ask the questions of Israel first tonight. But we do want to see how we can learn from them. So the first question... Why are you so worried? Well, the first thing we can say is that this chapter doesn't start the day after chapter 7 closes. The days of that beautiful, humble, true repentance. It's come and gone. Years have passed. Samuel is now old. Uh, Samuel was recognized as a prophet of God even from his earliest days. But now he's old. Samuel was faithful as he judged Israel all the days of his life, according to chapter 7, verse 15. But now he's old. Samuel wouldn't be around forever. Something else is worrying here in verse 1. Samuel made his sons judges over Israel. That was something new. That was something unprecedented. Something unexpected. And when old, faithful men do something unexpected, alarm bells start ringing. God himself raised up judges before, but never in this hereditary way. Was it good? Was it right that Samuel did this thing? Israel are worried. And perhaps rightly so, because his two sons, uh, who minister some 50 miles south of Ramah, down near the southernmost parts of Israel in Beersheba. They're down there. This is maybe a wise move from a certain point of view, from a kind of pragmatic point of view, judging the whole nation. Well, let's spread ourselves out. I'll stay up here in the north, men, and you two, my sons, you go to the south. But down in Beersheba, they're away from dad, they're away from their father, and these two young men, they do their own thing. And I think that was the most worrying part of all verse 3 but his sons did not walk in his ways and they turned aside after dishonest gain took bribes and perverted justice now the perversion of justice is bad enough when it's done by regular citizens but how much worse is it when the judge himself is corrupt and greedy and quick to take bribes This is spelling out a disaster for Israel if these men are going to take over. And the elders of Israel, to be fair to them, they know it. And they're worried. And so in verse 4 they come to Samuel and then they say, verse 5, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And if only... This new generation 
had come to Samuel as their fathers did in the previous chapter. Chapter 7, verse 8. If only they had said, said that. Do not cease to cry out to the Lord for us. But that's not what this generation's after. They don't turn to the Lord. They just want to be like the other nations round about. Why are they worried? Because they've forgotten who they really are. They are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people. Their whole purpose in life is to proclaim the praises of him who called them out of darkness into his marvellous light. I've lost sight of that. Maybe that is where their fathers were at. But now, well, we've moved on. We've caught up with the modern world. We need a king now, like the other nations round about us. That's what we need. What happened? Did, did their fathers fail to teach them? Did they not bring them to Sunday school and Friday club? Did they fail in family devotions? Did they just let it go? What happened? Whatever the reason, this generation have not only forgotten who they are, they have forgotten the Lord. They're asking for something they already have. They've already got a king. The Lord is their king. And Samuel's sons, in one sense, did remind them of that very fact. Joel means the Lord is God. And Abijah means the Lord is my father. But they didn't remember the Lord as God or as father. They didn't remember how God had saved them before. We could talk about the exodus from Egypt, the wilderness wanderings, conquest, settlement of the promised land. But actually the Lord has delivered them from this specific same worry before. An old man, two wicked sons, it's just the last generation. Eli and Hophni and Phineas, his two wicked sons. God dealt with that situation. Wicked men were removed. Samuel was put in place as judge. It's just one generation on and they've lost it. They've forgotten. Bring it home, please, to your own heart. What are you worried about? You're worried about your children. Believer, you have prayed to God for them since they were conceived. The Lord has brought them through many things already. You've prayed, no doubt, when you've sat in A&E, when you've had to take them in there in a hurry. You've prayed when they're out with their friends and you're not exactly sure what they're getting up to. You've prayed when they seem to be rebelling against the Lord himself. And the Lord has answered your prayers before. Don't forget that. Choose to remember it. And do not cease to pray. Oh, what else are your worries tonight? What else in the future are you, are you concerned about? Is it the future of your job? future of this church the future of Northern Ireland the future of your own walk with the Lord do not cease to pray remember the Lord is God remember the Lord is your father you don't need to look out into the world round about and see how they are dealing with the troubles and stresses of this life you don't need a new leader that you can really get behind. You've already got a king. Remember him. Remember his past deliverances. Remember the cross. Choose to remember. Jesus loves me. This I know. 
For the Bible tells me so. Cease from worry. But do not cease to pray. Second question. Why do you often feel that you're the only solution to the problem? Israel didn't remember their great king and all that he had done for them. Instead, Israel rejected the Lord. That was God's view as to what was really happening here in this thing. There is this lovely compassion in what the Lord says uh, to Samuel personally. And that it's not about you, Samuel, in verse 7. Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them. They don't want the Lord to reign over them. They want to reign over themselves. They want to appoint their own king. And the Lord says in verse 8 that this is what they've always been like. Ever since God brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, which which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. It's what they're like. Other gods, other gods which they have chosen. So they've always fallen down. They didn't really want a king who has chosen them. Even if that king is the Lord of glory, their creator, their redeemer, the one who has delivered them out of the hands of their enemies time and time and time again, maybe that was good enough for a previous generation. But we want to be free to choose out our own life and our own king. And if we're ever faced with trouble as previous generations were, you know what? We're okay. We can handle it ourselves. And what perhaps is scary here is that God answers this awful, selfish prayer. God gives them their desire. He says to Samuel, listen to what they're saying. Give them what they want. Doesn't it remind you of the prodigal son? Luke 15. The beginning of that story starts in Luke 15, 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. God is sovereign. And in precise accordance with his divine sovereignty, he often gives us what we want. Jonah ran from God. Oh, if only there was a boat to Tarshish. Oh, look, there's a boat to Tarshish. Brilliant. I'm away. He got what he wanted. That wasn't the end of the story. When the prodigal son ran away from home, that wasn't the end of the story. And likewise, this story, though it does seem dark here, it will end on a brighter note. Their first king will not be all that they ever wanted. Quite the opposite. Their second king, whom God will choose, will be much better. And the final king will be a king forever. We're not there yet. We're stuck in the selfish, egotistical, I've got this, bravado. God gives them a gracious warning about what a king like the other nations will really be like. You see, yes, for, for Israel, the grass in Philistia, it's so much greener over there. They have a king. They appointed their own king. They can see him with their eyes. He can ride out before them in battle. Brilliant. Oh, we want that. That's the way to do it. We can learn from them. Samuel, give us a king. We'll do it. And Samuel warns him, verses 11 to 18, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. And glance down at please with me. What's going to happen? He will take your sons for the Ministry of Defence, for the Ministry of Agriculture, 
for the Department of Infrastructure. It's going to take your sons. It's going to take your daughters for perfumers or confectioners, cooks, bakers. He will take the best of your fields, vineyards, olive groves. He will take 10% of your produce to finance his civil service. And he'll take your servants. In fact, you will be his servants. God is warning them. A king like the other nations is going to be a taker. And you're going to end up as you were in Egypt. You're going to end up slaves to your new king. But I'm warning you now. If you persist with this request and all these hardships come upon you and then you cry out to me for deliverance, you're on your own. The Lord will not hear you in that day. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, No, but we will have a king over us. We can handle it. The Lord may have been the solution for the old generation. But we're going to make our own way in the world. Yes, the old, they they relied on God. But we rely on our own wits, on our own brains, on our own technology, on our own strategy. We're not saying that the old generation were wrong. But we're the future. And we want a king. What's wrong with this generation? Their ears are wrong. They are no good at listening. The king you want, the king you're asking for, is going to be a taker. Don't do it, says Sammy. It's the Lord. He's the one you need. Listen. Listen to what he says. This warning is from him. Oh, well, I hear what you say. I've got full respect for the old generation and their ways. But honestly, things are different now. And a new day calls for a new approach. Yes, we know that for you old people, the Lord was the answer to everything. But to tell you the truth, that's not going to cut it in our modern world. I wonder, do you ever think like that? Do you imagine that there are problems in your life and the Lord is not the answer? Uh, This is something I have to fix. I I have to sort this. Uh, And maybe you've tried other kings, other good people. And you've put your trust in them. And then you go to the one king that you really know you can trust. The king in the mirror. If you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. You ever think like that? I know I do. It only show, shows that I'm, I'm not a good listener when I'm saying stuff like that. Jesus said, John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can turn that around. I can do nothing without Christ. But are you listening to that? The world, of course, will tell you, you can do anything you put your mind to. It's simply not true. It's nonsense. You're not Bob the Builder. You can't fix everything. You can't fix your kids. And you can't fix your marriage. And you can't fix your financial mess. You cannot fix your own sinful heart. You cannot fix disease and suffering and death. But there is one who can fix all these things. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And you need him as your king. There is no one like him. But maybe that's the problem. 
Maybe that's where you have an issue here. Because, you know, that's just about weird. Jesus, it's just about weird. You can't get away from the thought. Jesus and all of that, that was good enough for my parents, good enough for my grandparents. But the world just isn't there anymore. Everyone else has moved on past this. And I want to move on too. It brings us to our last question. Why are you scared of standing out and looking weird? The Lord told Samuel in verse 7, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. Note the wording there. Listen to all that they say. It's not just that they want a king. Actually, that would be okay. The civil law had made provision for that. The trouble is that they want a king like all the other nations. And that's their final word in verse 20. That we also may be like all the nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. We don't want to be awed. We don't want to go to the equivalent of the EU summit or the G8 talks. And be the only one with an invisible leader. The invisible king. We don't want to go into battle for the king that no one can see. It's just a bit odd. Maybe the old generation, they thought that was okay. Didn't, didn't they bring an ark, the ark of God, into battle with them? Sure, that backfired. That didn't work. No, no, no we, we want to be just like the other nations of the world. But they weren't. They were nothing like the other nations of the world. They were God's holy nation. They were different. Who else had the creator of all things as their God and Father? Who else had the one true God as their King? Who else had been delivered again and again and again throughout their whole history by the hand of their God? Who else had a king who would uh, provide them uh, with, with food and with drink for 40 years in the wilderness and ensured that even their shoes didn't wear out? What other nation had a God like that? No one. Who else had a king who came and entered into covenant with his people, married to his people, even promising to take their own covenant breaking to himself? I'll pay the price when you break covenant. What other nation had that? No, no other nation. Israel were unique. Brilliantly unique. They didn't want to be. Just wanted to fit in. Should have been so proud of their king. No other nation had a king like the Lord. They just didn't see it that way. (coughs) They wanted to be the same. Let's get a king like the other nations. It's hard to be holy. It's hard to be different. We're not denying that. But believer, you have the best reason in the world to be different. You have a king. And he is absolutely (coughs) glorious. He is so much better than what we imagine him to be. Israel imagined they should have a great man. Rich, powerful, mighty leader, fearless, proud. Such as the one that they would opt for in the next chapter. That would not have been God's choice. If you turn over to Deuteronomy 17... And verses 14 to 20. We can read the provision there for a king. Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. Just scan down it with me please. What kind of king did God have in mind for his people when this moment came? Verse 15. God's choice. God was going to appoint them a king. Verse 16. Not loads of horses. 
not militarily strong. Verse 17, not rich. Verses 18 and 19, filled with God's word. Verse 20, not proud. That's God's choice. We recognize him, don't we? You recognize him from that description. That's the king that was promised. The fulfillment of that is Jesus, sent by God, sent into poverty and weakness, born in a stable, laid in a manger, never multiplied horses and built a great army of military strength. He he borrowed a coat once and he rode into Jerusalem. Jesus is the opposite of the king that Samuel warned against. Because Jesus was not a taker. Jesus is a giver. He gave healing. He gave new life from the dead. He gave living water to those who would believe. He gave his life for his sheep. Paul could say he loved me and gave himself for me. He's the one who gives repentance and faith and forgiveness and pardon and everlasting life. He gives us his Holy Spirit so he can live in us and we can live for him. He gives us every spiritual blessing. But it's still hard to be holy. But look to Jesus. Look to the true king. Keep your eyes on him. Only then will you be willing to be different. What's wrong with this new generation? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? You're worried? Remember your king. Do not cease to pray. You often feel you're the only solution to the problem. Listen to your king. He's the answer you need. You're scared of standing out, looking weird. Look to Jesus and be willing. He is a giver and he will give you all you need. To live for him. Amen. Let's pray please.